Whoa, that's pretty weird. I think I'm in the middle of Saturn's rings. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and while well, completely unrelated to Saturn's rings, today we're actually going to be discussing the idea of dangers of space, space exploration. Or I guess more specifically, the idea of health and space. Is it actually dangerous for us to be in space? And if so, why? And this is actually a continuation of a relatively long series of similar videos, many of which you can find in the description, with the overall answer being, yeah, it's not really safe to be here, but probably not for the reasons that you think. So things like, for example, asteroids or things like collisions is not going to play a role in this. But neither is the idea of radiation. Based on a lot of different studies, especially in the twin study conducted by NASA, it looks like the space radiation is actually not as dangerous as we always thought. Okay, it might be a little bit extreme right here around Saturn, especially if you're in some of the more extreme locations where the magnetic fields create ridiculously high radiation, but the overall experience on, for example, the surface of Mars, or by living on the space station for a few years, is not as bad as we originally thought. Turns out that human body is able to adapt to radiation pretty quickly and even create conditions where our body becomes stronger over time. Specifically, for some reason, the immune system seems to improve. And you can actually learn more about this topic in one of the previous videos that should be in the description. But there are still a lot of dangers of living in space for different reasons. And the main reason in this case is microgravity. Or lack of gravity. Not having gravity is apparently really, really, really bad for human body. So bad, as a matter of fact, that every major health concern identified to date has always been the result of zero-g conditions, not anything else. Which once again confirms that gravity is super important for humans or for a lot of other life on planet Earth. And so in this video we're going to discuss some of the new studies from the last few months and focus on some of the new discoveries and potential resolutions to some of these problems. But first, a super quick reminder of what was discovered just a few months ago by previous studies. So for example, one of the major findings was in regards to human blood. For some reason, there are a lot of mutations in the blood, and none of them seem to be related to radiation as much as actually adaptation to zero-g conditions. Human blood, and even red blood cells, seem to adapt and change in conditions where there's no gravity. We've also discovered that a lot of the astronauts staying in space a long time will often have most of their fluids shifted to the top of their body which causes a lot of issues with things like dehydration, because it turns out that they have to pee way more often than they would have otherwise. We also now understand major reasons for why a lot of astronauts experience the issues with vision and sometimes actually almost lose vision completely. Although the recent discovery that we're going to discuss in a few minutes clarifies this a little bit more. In a natural though, a lot of this is because of the changes inside the brain, as the brain redistributes some of the matter on the inside, increasing certain sizes in structure, and creating a lot of extra space. But intriguingly enough, the brain itself also rewires in space, even rewiring certain memories, or even the way that we think. So as mind-blowing as it sounds, if you actually go to space and spend enough time there, when you come back, in some sense you're not the same person anymore. The brain will have changed. We also understand why muscles atrophy so much, and even found a way to potentially reduce this by using certain types of massage techniques that could technically allow astronauts to have muscles when they, for example, arrive to Mars. But in this case, it's not just the muscles that are going to be lost, it's also bone density. And that could be remedied by certain types of lattice, specifically genetically modified lattice, that in theory could provide all of the calcium needed for astronauts on a long journey, traveling for six months to locations like Mars. And so in the last year or so, there's been some major breakthroughs in both understanding of what happens to us in space or specifically in zero-g conditions, and how to potentially solve some of these problems. But not all problems. As a matter of fact, most problems are still unresolved. And today we're going to be discussing even more problems discovered recently. All of this based on studies from hundreds of different individuals that lived in space for at least a few months. And so here, once again, some of the first studies were in regards to vision problems, which was previously linked to a sudden increase in cerebrospinal fluid in certain locations inside the brain. Here's actually a really intriguing video showing us how the CSF, or cerebrospinal fluid, circulates inside the brain. And so inside the brain, this fluid is usually stored in four different pockets known as ventricles. Here it's stored for several reasons. First, it protects the brain from potential physical damage, but it also serves as a kind of a waste management system 
washing away various molecules that are no longer required. But in space, these ventricles increase in size because of lack of gravity, thus generating a lot of pressure inside the brain. And as a result of this increase, the astronauts often actually experience major issues inside the brain, with one of the first issues being the loss of vision. With a new study based on 30 different astronauts, discovering that longer space flights increase the ventricle size even more. And so anyone spending time in space for over 6 months will usually have a dramatically increased size of these ventricles. But intriguingly, at some point, that particular increase in size doesn't change anymore, so as long as the astronaut gets used to it, it's no longer a problem after that. And so this unusual change in the brain is essentially a way for the brain to compensate for the lack of gravity in order to then accommodate cerebrospinal fluid required for the functioning. Although interestingly, the most dramatic changes in size were actually observed in astronauts spending the least time on the station, specifically astronauts spending less than 6 months, which right now only has one explanation. All of these changes seem to happen at first and very suddenly, but as you spend more time in space, the actual changes are no longer as dramatic, eventually reaching a peak, at which point they no longer change anymore. But this still does cause quite a lot of problems, even to astronauts that come back to Earth, with the ventricles still remaining in large even after years of, even after they return to Earth. And so at the moment this is probably going to be one of the major problems for any astronauts traveling to Mars. Although obviously, sending experienced astronauts, or the ones whose brains have already changed, and the ones that are kind of used to it, is probably going to be one of the best solutions here. But it's still not going to solve the major issue, vision. This even has a name now, it's known as Space-Associated Neuroocular Syndrome. Essentially, one of the most serious risks for any astronaut on long-duration flight, especially to potential locations like Mars. I mean, imagine the mission to Mars where the main pilot suddenly, after about 5 months, completely goes blind. And that's of course currently the major concern. And though there's no resolution to this just yet, the scientists have actually worked out a really cool technique that allows us to now measure this and potentially predict the onset of this unusual condition, or this, I guess, blindness, before it happens. It's actually based on this study that you can find in the description, that in a nutshell is able to measure the brain fluid pressure inside by using a brilliant non-invasive method, a super clever technique that uses pulsations inside the retina of the eye, tiny tiny veins present inside the eye whose movement changes with the pressure inside the brain. And so in essence, by using a specialized camera, it becomes possible to monitor the pressure inside the CSF, and more importantly, directly predict any potential ocular disorder that might happen to the astronauts. Naturally, as you can imagine, there are going to be a lot of other medical applications to this really cool technique, especially when it comes to various brain disorders. And so at the moment this is probably one of the best solutions we've discovered so far for how to at least predict the onset of blindness, even though we still don't really know how to prevent it from happening. There were also some intriguing discoveries about the immune system, and specifically discoveries that zero-g conditions don't seem to affect any immune system functioning in any major way. This was actually done by conducting various parabolic flights and by looking at various types of cells inside the blood in order to see how they were affected by zero-g conditions, and so far it looks like nothing dramatic happens here, and the immune system seems to function as intended. And this was actually one of the bigger concerns for longer missions, because we don't really know how the immune system is going to be affected, and if the astronauts are just going to get sick before arriving to their location. Turns out that this might not be a problem, especially since other studies have also discovered that the immune system seems to improve in conditions where the radiation is slightly elevated. Somewhat unexpected, but that's what so far was discovered. There were also some really intriguing studies on the CNS, the central nervous system. Not just the brain, the entire system. Although in this case this wasn't really done on humans, but it was done on fruit flies. Maybe not exactly the same thing, but turns out that approximately 75% of all of the genes that cause disease in humans will often also cause problems in fruit flies. And also fruit flies generally reproduce within 2 weeks and don't live longer than approximately 2 months, and so they can show us genetic changes very quickly, within just a year. And so quite a few of these were sent to the International Space Station, living inside this really cool device known as MVP, Multi-Use Variable Gravity Platform, basically a device that can generate some gravity inside through centrifugal force, thus generating control conditions and conditions without gravity whatsoever. And so here, for approximately 3 weeks, the scientists studied how the flies progressed. 
obviously in different gravity conditions. Specifically, one group was exposed to artificial gravity, the other group had nothing. And the main point was to study their behavior. Did the behavior of these flies change, especially once returned back to Earth? Was their central nervous system affected by these changes in gravity? And the answer was obviously yes. Flies that lived in microgravity, or basically zero-g, were much more active than the ones in artificial gravity, but had a lot of trouble performing various tests when returning to Earth. And on top of this, the flies in artificial gravity also seemed to age differently. They did not experience as much stress and did not exhibit negative behavior, which implied that there seems to be some kind of a stressor and some kind of a negative change on a lot of nervous system cells that we still don't understand, but seems to have adverse effects on organisms living in zero-g conditions for a long time. But the most intriguing discovery was that artificial gravity seemed to protect these flies from most of these negative changes and from major changes in behavior. And that of course implies that by using some kind of a centrifuge, if traveling to far locations, might pretty much do the same to human CNS as well. So yeah, thanks little guys. I mean, we kind of expected this to happen, but thanks for confirming what the scientists expected previously. But if nothing else works, something from this study might have discovered something really intriguing that could work for long-term travel. Torpor, or I guess hibernation. There's actually a video in the description that goes a little bit more through various recent discoveries in regards to this topic, but the discovery here is also kind of surprising. Turns out that there might be a physical way to induce torpor-like conditions or hibernation-like state by doing something that's once again non-invasive. Although, okay, this is only done in rats so far, so this might not apply to humans, but there's a really high chance that it might work in humans as well. And here they used ultrasound or a kind of an ultrasound speaker that would blast very loud noise into the rat's brain. It sort of looks like this. Now, even though the noise was loud, because it's ultrasound, they can't really hear it. But surprisingly, it has a very unusual effect on the rest of the body. And the effects were visible within just minutes. Here, the temperature of the body decreased by approximately 4 degrees, and the heart rate slowed down dramatically as well, overall reducing the oxygen consumption, and of course metabolism, basically putting these rats into a kind of a torpor. Now, we know that a lot of animals on Earth already use torpor or other types of hibernation to essentially survive difficult conditions, but it's still kind of difficult to induce it physically, especially without invasive techniques. But ultrasound waves pointed directly at hypothalamus, and specifically hypothalamus preoptic area, the area that's located somewhere right there, seems to suddenly cause these unusual changes with somewhat lasting effects. And if the body temperature increased again, all you have to do is blast the ultrasound again. In this experiment, they were actually able to maintain the state for at least 24 hours. And the rats did not experience any discomfort or injury whatsoever. But once the speaker was turned off, it took approximately 90 minutes for the rats to regain their normal state. So this is actually a really intriguing discovery of potentially how we could induce similar state in more advanced animals as well. This could obviously would be a great opportunity for astronauts, or could just generally be used in a lot of other ways in a lot of medical fields. So for example, for astronauts, all they have to do is wear some kind of a helmet that can produce these sounds pointed directly at hypothalamus, and if so, it probably wouldn't look very different from what you see right here. We've discussed this in that previous video that you can find in the description, but in theory, by wearing an ultrasound speaker on your head, you could basically sleep through the entire Martian trip just to wake up and be ready to work without experiencing a lot of detrimental effects from being in zero-g conditions. Mostly because by being in torpor or hibernation, the body would not have enough time to undergo various changes, including changes in the brain, and thus the astronauts arriving to Mars might be much healthier than they would be otherwise. And yeah, here we're mostly focusing on some kind of a crude adventure to Mars, not really so much anything else for now. And so definitely some really cool news about potential suspended animation for long-term space travel. Although here it's important to understand that normally hibernation involves a lot of other changes, including hormonal and molecular changes, that were not observed here. So in order to actually have full hibernation, just having this helmet would probably not be enough. Something else would have to be done as well. Nevertheless, very cool start. And so as of mid-2023, at least for now, these are some of the major discoveries when it comes to, I guess, dangers of space travel or changes in human health when traveling in zero-g conditions. Previous videos are also in the description below describing some other additional discoveries, but we'll definitely be coming back and talking more about this once more discoveries are made in the next few months. 
subscribe. Thank you for watching. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. And maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful. I'll see you tomorrow. And as always, bye-bye.